Welcome back to the Aussie Shed, gentlemen. Today is a momentous day in the 370Z, 370GT, G37 DIY twin turbo project. Today's the day where hopefully this and this will become one once again. I spent the last few days going through everything, making sure that there are no clearance issues when the engine and transmission goes back into the body shell. Unfortunately, with a vehicle like this, that everything is so tight to begin with, when you add a complete twin turbo system, space is what you're constantly fighting for. It's been the biggest issue with the whole project. Sure, you have to actually be able to build all the components to make a project like this possible. But that being said, just trying to make everything fit has just been such a headache and has slowed everything down so much. It's taken me way, way longer than I thought it would have to get to this stage, just purely because of the constant battle trying to make everything fit. So the bottom line is, folks, I think I've finally nailed it. I've just been going over the whole uh, engine transmission combination, just tidying up absolutely everything I've had the body shell up and down many many times in the last couple of days just checking out all of the clearances things are just so woefully tight now sometimes having a tight fit is a good thing but then sometimes it's not and this is one of those occasions there are several components that i have had to um, remake and modify throughout the build due to the fact that with the engine sitting here on the front chassis on the table I will approach things in a certain way to get it to fit as neatly as possible with everything that's here and it's always in the back of my mind how it's going to work with everything up there but unfortunately when you put the two things together there are always unforeseen circumstances for example things may not be complete there may be something missing off the engine or something missing off the body shell that will interfere with what i've set up uh, when it's completely reassembled i have actually had to modify uh, a lot of the wiring looms and hoses for various things the ac hoses heater hoses uh, power steering hoses they've all had to be modified just purely for clearance so enough of my whinge about the tight fit let's have a look at what's been done since the last time you would have seen the project as you can see all of the piping has now been painted i just sort of to go for that stealth look when you look into the engine bay now with the engine up in the vehicle all of this turbo stuff is basically invisible because of the tightness of the fit to begin with peering down in between the components all you can see is blackness if there are no shiny pipes uh, jumping out at you you just literally cannot see any of it which is fabulous and, and exactly what i'm after because what i've been trying to achieve here is a stock standard looking engine bay and i think as far as the average person would be concerned it will look like a stock standard engine bay so let's have a little bit of a walk around and we'll just go over a few things as i said all the pipe work's been painted um, i know i've talked about heat shielding in a previous video but i've done even more heat shielding now now that everything's been finalized there was a little bit of stuff left to do because i still had the transmission off at that stage before i fitted the fast intentions flex plate but now that's all done i've been able to complete a lot of the heat sleeving in that area so you'll notice here on the back um, there is heat sleeving absolutely everywhere all the control wires for the transmission have been re-sleeved what sleeving was there has been extended all the cables across this side, uh, new cables, extra cables have been added in. I have an aftermarket uh, oxygen sensor mounted in this left-hand side dump pipe that goes underneath and comes back up through this side. Um, also, a lot of heat sleeving required over here because of the closeness with that wiring to, to uh, this wastegate pipe here. You can see up here, this is all the vacuum lines for the wastegates that all run down here. They all have heat sleeving. All the hose has like small spring-loaded clips fitted to it. Everything is tied back with cable ties, which is an absolute must. I don't know what you'd do without cable ties to be able to just pull everything in nice and tight. You can see even down here, the... Where are we? I'll just zoom in on this, folks. Come on, camera. Zoom. Even the transmission cooler lines here, where they 
where they run in behind the exhaust and everything, they all have heat sleeving on them? Absolutely everything is heat sleeved. Major heat sleeving has been done in the steering area down here where the, uh, the rack and pinion is quite close to the turbos. Um, all of the original power steering lines have had extra heat sleeving put on them and uh, just everything's been wrapped in sleeving and, and whatnot. Uh, you've seen the wiring loom up there. Just everything has been super, super heat sleeved and also had a major tuck. You can see here looking at the back of the engine, absolutely everything is tucked in really, really tight in every direction. It's basically the only way to get this thing to fit. The engine bay is a rectangular shape, so that's basically what we've had to do with the engine is just follow that rectangular shape and just keep everything packed in in every direction so that it fits. There is literally no clearance anywhere. There's no space that hasn't had something put into it. It has just been a serious packaging issue. Particular tight spots have always been my driver's side, right-hand side here in Australia, which is where the steering box and everything is. I imagine in the US you have the same problems on the other side. Right from day one, turbo manifolds, absolutely everything has been just a huge pain in the ass to get everything to fit on that side. The issue that's compounded by the vehicle being right-hand drive here is the fuel lines are also uh, come up the body shell on that side, so there's... Um, even less area where the turbo and everything has been kind of shifted to make it fit with the steering. It gets close to encroaching on the, the fuel lines. There's just, it's just everything. Everything is on that side and it just sucks. This side here has been much easier. Uh, the clearance issues haven't been anywhere near as great on that side, just having that little tiny bit more room to work with. Uh, the only issue I've had over here is this corner. It sits fairly close to the body shell. And getting this uh, hose to run through here, you can see it's just basically been tucked right hard against the head in that position. Just And that just sneaks in on the corner of the vehicle. So we'll go around the front and have a bit of a look. So yeah, back to the front. Apologies folks, I can't pull the camera back anymore. If I had a wider angle lens, it'd be probably a little bit on the helpful side. But that's the, the widest shot that I can sort of give you. As you know, if you've been watching all my other videos, the oil gallery gaskets have been done, uh, water pumps have been done, all that sort of stuff, all new bearings in all of the pulleys, ADI super damper, and it's all looking pretty good. Once again, just bloody packaging, mate. I've had to frig around uh, quite a bit with the intake pipes for the turbos on this side and that side over there. Uh, you can see the kind of shape that's been that we've ended up with on this side here. Um, to get a position in the front guard, in the sort of front guard um, bar area, to be able to get air cleaners in there, I probably went a little bit large with the air cleaners because I was, I was concerned about um, airflow with smaller air cleaners. I had these air cleaners here just sitting on the shelf and I thought, yeah, I might give those a bit of a bit of a throw in and, and sort of see how they go. But uh, they're a no-name air cleaner and I was a little bit concerned about airflow, um, whether they would be able to pass enough air to not become a restriction on the engine. As I say, they're no-name, there's no specs available on them. And I thought, well, the easiest way to solve that problem is to fit the absolute biggest air cleaner that I can fit in there. So, so what I've got was these guys, which are substantially larger than these ones that I had here. Plus, might I just say, getting air cleaners in two and a half inch, which is the piping size here, there's very little to choose from. It's uh, not a very broad selection. Three inch is the most popular size for um, pod filters or there's a hell of a lot more available in 3-inch. At one, at one point, I was, getting, I was thinking about even flaring the pipe up to 3-inch just so that I had a bigger selection of air of pod filters. So anyway, these are the guys that I've got here. They're a fairly cheap thing. It's just a ProFlow, all stainless. It's got a stainless mesh in it with some sort of a filter element. Um, but they are really, really large and very free-flowing. So they're probably going to be a bit a bit sad on the side of uh, dust protection for the engine, but they certainly will not be a flow restriction. And they were cheap enough that I can run them for a bit, 
and see what I sort of think of them. If they do suffer from a lack of filtration, I can just, uh, you know, chuck them in the bin and, and get some K&Ns or whatever. But uh, I had trouble finding a K&N that would fit um, with all the measurements and everything that I made. There was only one uh, particular size of K&N filter that I could fit into the area and it wasn't available to me. So, you know, this is kind of just what I ended up with. But as I say, very large pod filter, but I have made them fit, but there is absolutely no room in these either. As I say, as you can see from the pipe work here, I had to do quite a bit of work to be able to get this all to sort of fit. And the same on this side, but not as complicated. The issue with this side was that we had to step this intake pipe back because of the bottom radiator hose on the engine sits here and it's very very close it's actually like there's only a couple of millimeters between the back of the radiator hose and this pipe here and i've also actually trimmed a little bit off the off the radiator hose to pull it slightly forward so basically that's what all this is about it was a way to get around the radiator hose and then bring it back forward again just to be able to make everything fit so at this stage folks i'm, I'm pretty excited but i'm trying to hold back and not and not sort of hurry myself at this point uh, this is where I need to be really, really careful and just check and double check everything. I've just been peering over the engine for quite a few hours this morning, just looking for anything that I have missed. I did find one thing. I found a heater hose up the back here, tucked right in at the back of the engine that I hadn't replaced. So, yeah, that was a really good find because, honestly, to get to that, I probably would have had to pull the motor out again. And that is the biggest issue with this now. Um, all this sort of extra complicated hardware is totally inaccessible once the, the vehicle is put together. You know, maintenance is quite a concern, so I have to try my absolute utmost to make sure that I'm not in a position where I have to pull the bloody thing back out in a couple of weeks' time or even a few days, you know, or a week or, or whatever. So bottom line, I'm trying to be just Mr. Super Thorough and just pray at you know, fingers crossed that, that everything works because there is so much that can go wrong on a build like this when nothing's been tested. You know, it's it's a custom build. There is just literally so many areas for a potential problem. Even something simple, as I say, like a coolant leak from a hose could mean engine, engine out. You know, a, a connection that I haven't done up fully tight, a bolt that wasn't torqued down, you know, the simplest thing, something that's rubbing that uh, could potentially be a huge problem that, I, that I've somehow missed, um, you know, or something that just hasn't worked the way it was intended to. So that's where I am at the moment, folks. What I'm about to do now is do a spanner check on basically everything that I can get hold of. So that'll take me a little while, but I'm just going to go over all of the accessible nuts and bolts, all of the accessible hardware, and just check that it's all been done up properly. So bear with me folks, spanner check time. Alright folks, I think I'm pretty happy with that. I think the time has come. One quick thing I didn't mention folks, just down here on this uh, sort of front chassis rail where the intercooler pipes sort of come over there. I've put nut certs 
into that front chassis rail and I have all the intercooler piping uh, bolted into that front rail with, with nuts there. So that's what's on the inside there on both sides. And, uh, and then the same deal on the outside. Under there there's another bolt just to keep all that sort of nice and secure. Anyway, I'm excited folks. I might just drop the engine down nice and low so it clears when I drop the body shell down to the point that it goes down to and then I can just slowly bring the engine up underneath uh, checking that everything's going to fit. This will give you a bit of an idea of how tight everything is, folks. I've got to pull the end of the steering shaft just slightly off the uh, one of the water cooling pipes for the turbo on this side, just to get it past it. Once it gets past the pipe, it's okay, but to slide it up past, it touches on the way through. I've got to be careful I don't damage it, make sure it doesn't bind up. But you can see here the inside of the, the inside of the frame is there. And that's so my hands are resting on the inside of the, the frame and they're resting on the outside of all the pipe work and everything. There is just literally no clearance. Oh, there is clearance, but obviously it's only a couple of millimeters. So I'll just keep pumping. Double check the steering again, make sure it cleared properly. I think that's it folks I think I am there so I'll just hold it in that position for a bit folks I'll just uh, go over the whole vehicle check everything all out to make sure that there are no clearance issues with anything and uh, and then I'll throw some bolts in it we'll take another look at it well so far so good folks all the subframe bolts are back in the gearbox cross member is bolted back up and I have tackled all the really hard things to hook up, which would have been possible culprits for me having to pull it back out and make further adjustments. But that's all gone pretty well. So I have started to hook a few things up. If you look down here, I've got the uh, intercooler and everything hooked up to the charge pipes. The recirculating blow-off valves are on, the air cleaners are on. Actually, I'll pull the camera off and I'll give you a bit of a look. Apologies in advance for any shitty, shaky camera work, folks. Alright, so... You can see that's my driver's side recirculating blow-off valve there. All sort of hooked up nicely. Air cleaner and everything's on. Come across this side. Same deal. It's all looking pretty good. As you can see, these are my transmission cooler lines. Haven't touched those yet, still very early days. That's uh, where the pipe work sort of comes through underneath and everything there. You can see in the engine bay here, uh, I've been working, you know, in areas, uh, for example here, hooking up all the heater hoses and everything. This goes into the custom block that I made, the, the custom sort of billet block that I made on the engine to hold all the new water line connectors and everything. Uh, this feeds the heater and it also is part of the water cooling system for the turbos. You can see this is my uh, bleed valve setup I have here. 
which is part of the cooling system now there was originally like a plastic fitting here that had a, um, a bleeder on it so that you can properly bleed the system when you fill it so I've just used an AN style cap onto that and under directly underneath this is a um, is a takeoff which uh, is part of the turbo water cooling and very hard to get all this sort of stuff on and everything I've also done the one on this side which is down in there which is why my fuel pressure regulator is out of here at the moment I had to take the fuel pressure regulator out so I can get to that that heater hose down there to reconnect it back up which also uh, is the either the inlet or outlet for the water cooling system for the turbos as well it has a similar thing to the other side just without the bleed valve and you can see mounted in the uh, the brake booster compartment here is my boost control solenoid valve and all of the um, silicon vacuum lines that you would have seen coming out of the back of the engine which are all sort of here they go through grommets in the firewall you can see them there and go into that uh, boost control solenoid and then obviously all the wiring runs back into the main unit inside the main wiring looms back in for the engine you can see it there it's back in it goes through there and runs up underneath the cowl here and then drops back through into the front of the vehicle on the passenger side just behind the glove box there's another main connector here sort of next to it and this is my sensor wiring loom all my aftermarket sensors I've actually redone all the wiring on these these were all done individually years ago and they weren't done in a fashion that made it really that easy to disconnect them to pull the motor so as I've put everything back together on this, I've also uh, done as much as I can to make future removal of the engine uh, as easy as possible. Uh, and this is a typical thing. I've incorporated all of the sensor looms onto the engine in such a fashion that they, they just have a main disconnection point now instead of having to disconnect them individually off the motor and stuff. And uh, they just sort of run up into this sort of conglomeration here, which I... Um, and still probably going to like to do something with unfortunately I have to keep all of the connectors separate so that I can if I want to strip them off otherwise I'd have like a big connector up here you know like maybe a 12 pin connector or something but it's just not convenient for me at the moment and the two pin connectors that I have are all a little bit large so um, yeah I'm, I'm just kind of using uh, I don't know what do you call these things bullet style insulated connectors at the moment which, if they're done properly, they're, they're sort of not too bad. Um, it'll all be sort of cable tied up and everything. Other than I've got a Deutsch connector here, which is the uh, cable for my aftermarket oxygen sensor, which I had to extend the cable um, to get it sort of to where I want it. The passenger side uh, turbo dump pipe on this side, up underneath, has a Bosch wideband oxygen sensor, and that's obviously the wiring for it that goes back to my... Uh, my PLX gauge system and also runs to the boost controller because the boost controller that I'm using it's a GFB it also monitors the richness and leanness of the engine and will do a, a, a boost cut or will will switch off the boost controller if it has a um, if it comes up lean on the O2 sensor not a bad way of sort of uh, integrating O2 capability into the into the boost system so as I say, Deutsch connector in that for that. It all runs back through that um, that waterproof sort of boat deck connector thing here that I showed you uh, right in the in the early stages of disconnecting everything. The, there's only one vacuum line uh, currently coming out of the vehicle. That's all I need. That's this little guy here, and that just runs back into the uh, boost controller handset and also into the, my boost vacuum controller for my PLX gauges. Uh, other than that, that's my only boost reference for inside. Obviously, there's lots of other uh, silicon vacuum hoses that are running boost stuff uh, coming out of the back of the engine there for, you know, waste gates, boost control, blow-off valves, etc. So, yes, I am making a little bit of a start. I haven't been under the vehicle yet to uh, start, you know, throwing things like the tail shaft and everything back in. But um, that's certainly where I'm heading. It's all looking pretty bloody good. That's the intake hard pipe there. 
and below that we have the charge pipe from the turbo as I sort of mentioned earlier I think I mentioned earlier I've put rivnuts nuts into these front chassis rails to hold um, all of the hard piping here there's one on this side for the intakes and then on the other side there's another one so they all have M10 bolts in them so it's a really super sort of a solid setup that uh, is all looking pretty good so from here folks I think I might uh, throw the car fully back up on the hoist and I'll start connecting things up under there uh, you know tail shafts got to go in sort of you know shields for everything the exhaust all got to go back on one of the main things I've got to do is uh, hook the steering shaft up to the universal joint under the engine and bloody fingers crossed there are no issues with that it's been something that's had to be considered with everything through this build hopefully I've done the right thing and it's all good so um, I'm about to find out in a big way so I'll head under the car and I'll do a bit and I'll give you another look welcome back lads a couple of days later now, I've been a busy little boy working on the project. And I've got quite a lot done. I'll take you underneath and we'll have a little bit of a look. As I mentioned, I was going to start assembling stuff underneath the vehicle. If we look up here, folks, you can see the tail shafts in. All the heat shields are back in. The exhaust is all back together and all properly installed. The secondary oxygen sensors are mounted just after the cat's there. I have actually extended the wiring for those to get them back to the factory connector over here uh, towards the front of the gearbox. And everything sort of turned out pretty well. All the V-band clamps are all done up properly on the exhaust system and everything. And it's all looking pretty good. If you look back there, I've even got the rear wheels on. So that's that's got to be a bloody positive thing. As I was saying, I was a little bit concerned about the, uh, the steering and everything, but... Just sneak the camera up in there. That's all kind of worked out really well. Sort of up in there. Uh, there's no there's no clearance issues. The steering shaft is reconnected again. So the all the steering is uh, fully operational in the vehicle. Nothing's binding. Nothing's even close to binding. It, just looking at it through the viewfinder on the camera, it all looks you know, very tight and everything. But there is clearance with everything. There is plenty of... Um, Plenty of clearance for engine movement that it's not going to sort of rub on the steering shaft or anything like that. So that's all. Um, that's all pretty good. It's all, uh, you know, looking quite good up in here. Not that you can really see too much. Everything's pretty much bloody hidden now, which is good. Good but bad because you can't get to anything for maintenance. But uh, you know. It's the nature of the beast, isn't it, folks? It's just the way it is. Just going around to the front here, you can see the engine oil cooler. is uh, all hooked up. The transmission cooler is hooked up again now. Uh, lots of wires and pipes and all that sort of stuff have, uh, have been reconnected. You can see the front sway bar is hooked up. The uh, suspension is back together in one piece there now. Uh, all the body mountings uh, fully been sort of redone and everything's been talked down to spec So that's that's looking pretty good so far so good. I'm pretty confident with everything So I'm, I'm very happy with that So what I might do is pull the vehicle back down now and give you a bit of a look in the engine bay because I've been doing a bit of stuff in there as well take you walking with me again so you can see in the engine bay here uh, quite a bit uh, sort of happened it's looking a lot more complete again now the engine covers sitting on there just kind of temporarily and I've got the strut bar on there just uh, to give me a position for clearances in relation to the intake pipes here which is what I've just been working on uh, as you can see, this one's just about finished. There's a silicon joiner that goes here between the two and a half where it goes to three inch. I've got the MAF sensor mount done there. I still have to put a, a nipple on the back of this as a boost reference for the wastegates. Uh, that's not done yet. Um, I've 
almost got this charge pipe on this side done as well. I'm actually just in a position where I'm about to uh, set up the math mount, which I'll uh, I'll do for you guys while you're watching here. So you say you're hanging out with me at the moment, you'll get to see that. Um, yeah, bit of charge pipe work here. Like I say, oil coolers and everything are all sort of hooked up and and sort of run around everywhere. I've still got a, a, a crap load of wiring to deal with across the front here yet. Uh, I've got my power steering cooler mounted up here on the inner cooler. It's still way lower than the than the reservoir over here, but I'll see how that goes. If it if it starts to spew back into the reservoir, um, I'll possibly change it and drop it down somewhere. There's not a lot of choices for it though, which is why I put it up there. It was kind of an easy spot for it. But uh, it may not be the best spot for it. But there's only one way to find out. Still a bit of piping to do here. This this bit of pipe that's hanging off here, that's power steering. Uh, like I say, it's it's got to be sort of plumbed into the into the cooler and everything and back. Reservoir is actually hooked up to the pump again. Lots and lots of wiring's been kind of changed. I've actually painted my fuel pressure regulator all the aluminium base and everything for it just to kind of make it blend in just for a little bit more stealth look and I'm probably going to or I'm definitely going to be uh, putting some sort of a finish on these charge pipes whether I paint them or whether I powder coat them I've got a pretty good epoxy paint that I use that seems to hold up to things pretty well and I know my powder coater is uh, shut at the moment because of the virus bloody thing so I may end up painting these, and if it doesn't turn out any good, I'll just pull them off, and you know when he's back up and running, I'll just take him and him, and he'll be he'll be able to blast the finish that I put on there off real easy and, and powder coat them for me. But you never know; they might be okay. What else we got here? As you can see, you, it's all you know. You, you literally cannot see any of the turbo stuff anymore. It's all just disappeared. So look how how cramped everything is. Like, look at that, folks. How the hell does bloody anything fit in there? There's a turbo down in there. Bloody hell. I've had to, um, as I sort of hit on a, a bit earlier, I've had to move a lot of the wiring looms for stuff. This is the starter motor positive and the alternator uh, positive wire that recharges the battery. They've had to be moved substantially because of this intake pipe, they sort of interfered. They, I already actually had to move it once to uh, to put this strut bar in, but it's been that like that quite a lot with um, quite a few other wiring looms that have had to be just repositioned, you know, because they just don't quite work anymore. There's something that they're interfering with, and you just do all this sort of stuff on a priority basis. Things that you can move, you do, and things that you can't move take priority, obviously. Battery compartment there. It's sort of looking pretty back back together. You can't really see too much of anything in there anymore other than just the battery, all the aftermarket wiring, everything's all cable tied and sort of tucked away. Um, so yes, yeah, so far so good. I'm pretty happy with everything. Hopefully there's nothing I've forgotten or missed. I'm reasonably confident, but then, you know, I'm probably that's probably just a bit of wishful thinking. So as you can see, folks, it's coming along rather nicely. It's not going to be too long before I'm ready to fire it up now. Uh, it's just, yeah, just finishing stuff off, just bits and pieces. So as I say, I'm just doing the math mount for the uh, charge pipe on the passenger side over there. Uh, and it's over here on the bench, so we'll have a bit of a look, eh? So that's, this is the pipe here, folks. I've just uh, worked out its, worked out its position, and unfortunately it's, it's right where I've got to join in the pipe there. But, you know, it is what it is. There's no way around that. So what I'm currently doing at the moment, I've ground the weld down and I've got the MAF mount here. You can buy these on eBay and uh, from a lot of car joints. It's just a, a Nissan MAF mount. It just looks like it's been, um, you know, CNC cut out of just a piece of, uh, of aluminium. Great thing. Be something really, really hard to make yourself. But, uh, yeah, so it'll just go on, on here. And you have to be, if you are doing this, folks, you've got to be um, a little bit careful because they do mount one way. The mass sensor uh, has to w only works in one direction. The air um, 
flows through it a certain way and it almost looks identical on both both ways the same with the mount there's uh there's not a lot of difference between one way or another as far as how it looks and if you weld this on the wrong way the math sensor won't work so just be aware that you have to get your sensor boss positioned in the right direction so I've marked it out there. What I did was I've just set the set the pipes up on the engine, uh, had a look out where the original wiring loom, how far it's going to reach, and where I can put it, and where the ideal spot is. Obviously, you want the the MAF in a place where you've got as much sort of straight pipe as possible. Um, you obviously don't want it right in the middle of the bend because of the turbulence and and everything. So you want to uh, you know as undisturbed a path of air uh, as possible uh, to the MAF sensor. So. This is the only real straight bit, so I'm right in the middle of it, and that's where it is there. So what I'm doing now, I've just got that uh, the weld smoothed off so I can sit it down here properly, and I'm just about to mark and cut out the hole before I weld this guy on. So, if you're interested in watching, folks, just hang there. I'll remount the camera on the tripod, and I'll get into it. Getting close folks, just going to clean this up a little bit, it's been sitting around for a while so it's quite sort of oxidised on the edges as you can see before I weld it, just get it nice and clean. everything a little bit of a final wipe down with acetone folks I think we're pretty much ready to weld that on so just to keep my position here folks I've just wrapped a bit of PET tape around it to hold it PE tapes um it's a lot more heat resistant than normal tape however the glue still kind of softens uh, fairly quickly but mate, forget it getting a couple of tacks on this I do have to run the welder pretty hot though because that's a decent sort of chunk of aluminium so hopefully I can get a, a tack on a couple of corners before it uh, it comes off because it's it's quite hard to hold in the right position I struggled a bit with the one on the other side I had a couple of clamps and stuff and it just didn't work out so uh, this is the Mark II holding method. Hopefully this will do the job long enough for me to get a couple of tacks on there. And, uh, and I'll be good to go. All right. Want to get some tacks on it then, eh?
All right, so it looks like the tape held out just long enough. But long enough's good enough, folks. Give it a final clean. It's kind of sitting there together. That should be it folks, time to fully weld it. Sorry folks, my stupid camera stopped recording just as I was about to start welding. Unfortunately I don't have a real great camera and it only records in 20 minute intervals and it's pretty silent when it cuts off so mate, it does 20 minutes, I'm always trying to keep an eye on it but unfortunately from the noise of the welder and everything I didn't hear it cut off. So just like magic it's all welded up. I've just finished welding it. It's red hot at the moment. I'll let it cool down and then we'll take a bit of a look at it. So there it is, folks. All done. Um, yeah. Don't know what I can say about that other than it's welded on. So I've got one more little welding job to do. And then I'm going to start um, bead rolling all these ends with my handy dandy Aussie Shed built bead roller. So I'll just pull the opposite fella to this off. I've just got to weld a small barb onto it to give me a vacuum source for the waste gates. And um, so we'll just do that now. So that's our little nipple there, folks. I actually cut it off, uh, what was it? I think I cut it off a non-return valve. I couldn't find a decent little aluminium nipple to weld on there. Um, stuff's getting a little bit hard to get at the moment so I just dug that out of the Aussie shed it's a good little thing it's got a little base on it that gives me something to weld onto so that's what's going on there as I say this gives me a boost vacuum source for the waste gates so let's get it on eh but not in that way And there it is folks, one boost vacuum nipple welded on, a bit daggy but nonetheless absolutely fine. Just one more thing left to do with this folks, is drill that out and bring it through the other side as you can see, it's not through, I just welded it on there, very simple just to run a drill bit through it rather than trying to sort of position it. So, um, yeah, I'll just put that in the vise and, and drill it out. That's looking pretty good. As you can see in there, folks, when you come through anything with a drill bit, you always get a burr on the back of it. We want to get rid of that because we don't want that going uh, inside our throttle bodies or anything. So I've just got a little deburring tool here that normally goes in your drill press or your, your, your drill. I'm just going to sort of spin that around a few times in there by hand and hopefully uh, that'll get rid of the, the burr for me. Either that or I can just slip a file in there if I can't really, really kind of do it, but... Looks like I can just reach. Hmm. Just sort of slightly out of my reach. Yeah, 
There we go. You can see that's starting to look pretty good in there now, folks. I'll um, I might just grab a slightly larger deburring tool because I can get a grip on it with my fingers and just push a little bit more. There's just a tiny edge on it, which I'd really like to sort of take off. But uh, yes, you can see it's it's nice and through now. This will give me a little bit more to hang on to. That's done now folks, that gives me a nice little chamfer on the inside of the hole as you can see there. Absolutely bloody fantastic. Alright, so, what will we do now? I've just quickly thrown the charge pipes on just to give you a bit of a look folks. I'll just show you where that vacuum nipple was welded on, where it's sitting on the pipe. Just so you can sort of suss out where it's gone. So that's it down there folks. Just right there. So just hidden away. And as I say, that's just a boost reference line for your wastegates. We're coming up on 45 minutes now, folks. I think I've kept you away from the really important chores around the house that I'm sure your wife's been wanting you to do, like mow the lawn and, you know, pick up all your crap that's around the place. So I'm going to have to leave it there. In the next video, we'll bead roll all these pipes put a bit of paint on them, and then we'll just sort of go on from there. So as always, folks, thanks for stopping by the Aussie Shed. Bloody pleasure having you here with me. If you like this video, remember to give me a thumbs up. If you like my content in general, subscribe to my channel. Hit the bell so you get notifications of any new videos. And I'll see you on the next one. Cheers.